Okay, welcome to Oxygen Therapy and Devices, Part 1. And in this uh, lecture series module, we're going to try to cover some of the basis of oxygen therapy, some of the devices, and some of the uh, basic information that you need to know in order to set up um, oxygen devices correctly. Okay, so just let's do a quick review of uh, oxygen in general. And everyone should know that oxygen is present in the atmosphere. It's 21% is the FiO2. And the normal partial pressure is uh, about 159 millimeters of mercury, and that is at one atmosphere of 760. Um, oxygen supports combustion and is non-flammable. In other words, Oxygen itself does not burn, but it will uh, ignite and um, make a small flame into a much larger flame. Uh, we need to be careful when we utilize oxygen around petroleum products because it will influence the ignition of oxygen. And oxygen has paramagnetic properties. Uh, there's an oxygen analyzer, analyzer. It's an older one. It's known as the Beckman, but it was based on Pauling's principles of paramagnetism. And oxygen is produced by the process of fractional distillation. That is the process that uh, produces the majority of our liquid oxygen. And here's a picture of a bulk liquid oxygen tank. And there are some other trivia type questions uh, related to um, liquid oxygen. It's stored at uh, negative 183 degrees Celsius, very cold. It's got a 1 to 861 ratio. In other words, one cubic foot of liquid oxygen expands to 861 feet of gaseous oxygen. That's a advantage because um, you're able to store a lot of uh, liquid oxygen, which will then expand to a extremely large quantity of gaseous oxygen. Uh, as compared to st storing oxygen in a tank, um, you don't have a large reserve. Um, so the liquid is vaporized to a gas and then it is reduced to a pressure of around 50 psi and it's fed into the hospital piping systems. And oxygen cylinders, they are obviously compressed gas and they are available in a number of variety of sizes and they typically employ the safety connections PISS and DISS and we have a wide range all the way from H down to uh, at least a D cylinder. The H cylinder typically is the larger one, weighs about 135 pounds and holds about 244 cubic feet of oxygen whereas the E cylinder is typically the one that we use when we transport patients within a hospital. It weighs about 16 pounds and contains about 22 cubic feet of oxygen. The cylinders themselves are regulated by the Department of Transportation and the actual labeling uh, of the cylinders is regulated by the FDA. You want to make sure that the cylinders are uh, properly stored in a um, holder such as this and that they're not freestanding on the floor because if you were to knock the top of one of these cylinders off it can become a very dangerous projectile and your JACO regulations uh, also are very stringent and uh, require you to make sure that they're properly stored or that they're properly secured when you transport a patient. Uh, that brings us to the regulator portion or the flow meters uh, once the liquid oxygen is uh, piped in, uh, turned into a gaseous uh, state through the piping system of the hospital, then we obviously need a way to then uh, to deliver that gas to the patient. And as I mentioned earlier, um, it comes through the piping at around 50 psi, and therefore we've got to reduce it down. And that's what we have here. We have a variety of uh, flow meters or regulators that are designed to reduce it from 50 down to a flow that we can deliver to the patient. Uh, many different types of reducing valves. There are single stage and double stage. Basically the flow meters that you see here and the flow meters that you see here as well as even here 
they allow you to set an accurate level of flow to be delivered to the patient and they work primarily by a incorporating a restricted orifice, variable orifice, and you'll see that they have a little ball that floats up. In particular, in the Thorpe tube, there is a ball that regulates the flow. And one here that's more of a board on gauge type, uh, you have a, a dial where you actually can uh, pressurize needle and set it to a certain setting. There are different um, connectors, and you can see in this picture right here, as compared to this one here, that there are certain uh, types of connection systems, and hospitals uh, employ different types. So you have to be uh, pay attention to what type of uh, connection system uh, the hospital employs. Obviously, a flow meter such as this is not going to connect to a e cylinder. Um, however, a flow meter like this. Uh, will connect to maybe a H-cylinder if you have the right kind of um, regulator on it. So let's take a little bit more uh, look at the board on gauge and primarily this type of gauge here we use in oxygen transport and back pressure downstream will result in inaccurate flow reading. So if we cause an obstruction downstream, uh, what it'll actually do is it'll cause the flow reading here on the gauge to read higher than what the patient's actually getting. So that's not, that's a, that's a negative um, uh, complication, I would say, of this type of flow meter. Uh, we really would like to have it read accurate so that if we do have an obstruction uh, in the face of back pressure, we would know exactly what they're getting. In other words, if I were to obstruct the tubing, I would want to know that there's no flow coming through. In this uh, type of gauge, it actually can read higher. Um, that's a disadvantage. However, an advantage of this is that this will read uh, accurate regardless of the position of the tank. So whereas a Thorpe tube that has a little ball, uh, you can't really flip that over or flip it to the side because then you won't be able to read, uh, it won't read accurately. However, with the board on gauge, you can lay it on its side, you can lay the tank on the bed, and you would actually get an act, uh, accurate reading. Um, these are not really designed to be used with nebulizers because of the back pressure downstream, and again, you could get an inaccurate reading. So the Thorpe tube flow meter, which is next, uh, this is probably the most, one of the most common devices that we use. Um, obviously, it's typically plugged into the wall. Uh, a 50 psi gas source and then that is then reduced and we can regulate the flow you can see we can set the liter flow here depending on what the patient needs it employs a needle valve and a float and the needle valve actually which is inside here controls the flow and the little ball actually floats up in the flow meter and these can be either pressure compensated or non-pressure compensated and basically what that means is either they'll read accurate or inaccurate in the face of back pressure. Uh, most of them that we utilize today are pressure compensated. In other words, they read accurate in the face of back pressure. So if I were to obstruct the tubing uh, connected to this and kink it, uh, what you would see then, would the, the ball would go down to zero, which would indicate that the patient is not getting any flow. So that brings us to oxygen therapy delivery devices and primarily we divide them into either high flow or low flow devices and uh, this can be a little bit tricky to understand the difference between high flow and low flow but low flow devices may not meet the patient's inspiratory flow demands. In other words, when we place somebody on a low flow device the delivered FO2 uh, typically may not be guaranteed. We're not really able to set a accurate level of FO2 because the FO2 is going to be dependent upon the uh, flow coming through whatever device it is that we're incorporating as well as the um, inspiratory flow of the patient. A high flow device on the other hand typically provides enough flow to meet the patient's inspiratory demands therefore it delivers a more accurate FO2.
Um, and if you can imagine for a second that a normal adult inspiratory flow rate is somewhere between 35 and 40 liters per minute. So when we breathe in, we move about 35 to 40 liters of gas, room air, on a typical uh, minute of time. And in order to um, guarantee an FiO2, as we provide uh, oxygen to a patient, we need to at least meet that level of flow. Um, if we don't, then there's a good chance that, depending on the device that we're using, we will entrain room air, and therefore the FiO2 may not be accurate. Let me give you an example. 100% uh, jet nebulizer running at 10 liters. Well, at 100%, there is no entrainment. So therefore, the total flow to the patient is only 10 liters. If a person is, is breathing 30 to 40 liters per minute, then they're obviously going to be in training room air through the mask, and that will decrease the amount of delivered FiO2. And if you look up here at the cannula, well, that's why the cannula uh, typically delivers lower FiO2s. If we set somebody on a 2-liter nasal cannula, then the oxygen coming through the cannula is 100% oxygen. But because you have a considerable amount of entrainment, you have 21% room air mixing with 100% oxygen only at 2 liters. So if you mix 2 liters of oxygen with, let's say, 35 liters of room air, if that's what the person was breathing per minute, then you would expect that the FiO2 would be rather low in the range of maybe only 28% because you're diluting the 100% oxygen with room air. So an important thing to remember is that high flow does not necessarily mean high FiO2. Let me say that again. Uh, let me say that one more time. High flow does not necessarily mean high FiO2. And we'll be looking at a Venturi device, and we'll see that a 24% Venturi device is a high flow device, but it delivers a low FiO2. So when we're, when we're referring to uh, high flow devices, what we're doing is we're saying that we're giving enough flow through whatever system we're delivering as to limit any air entrainment, and that's how we guarantee the FiO2. Now, as you go up on some of these um, high flow devices, like a jet nebulizer, uh, they become less efficient because you, you don't have the uh, accuracy. And that is due to the insufficient amount of uh, flow that you're delivering through the system is not enough typically to meet the demands of the patient's flow. So uh, a nasal cannula, um, obviously this is a low flow device. We typically, you can see a picture of it here, the correct placement. Uh, I've also listed the types of materials that you need, the cannula, the flow meter, and you may or may not need a humidifier depending on your hospital policy, your department policy. Uh, we typically set the flow somewhere between 1 to 6 liters per minute. However, you may see uh, an individual on a higher flow, and we now use high flow cannulas as well, but that would be in uh, the next session. Um, it's definitely the most commonly used oxygen device. It's very convenient. Uh, it's very rapid, and we can provide FiO2 at a uh, low to uh, medium range uh, quickly to the patient. The delivered FiO2 is dependent on two factors, obviously whatever we set the flow at and whatever the patient's inspiratory flow rate is. As I mentioned before, if they have a very high inspiratory flow rate and they're breathing very deep and fast, that means they're going to be breathing in more room air and mixing 21% oxygen with the 100% oxygen coming out of the cannula. Uh, as far as humidifying it, uh, typically, if it's 4 liters or above, you humidify this. However, um, some patients report that uh, oxygen is very drying and irrit irritating to the nasal passages, and, and some hospitals may have a different policy as to uh, whether or not they humidify. So you have to check your... Uh, the clinical facility that you that you work at or that you're training at to see what their policy is. But obviously, if a patient feels that their nose is becoming dry, uh, it, it's not a problem to add a bubble humidifier. 
And down below here, I gave you a um, kind of a small cheat chart, chart that you should know. And you should definitely know the, the general ranges of uh, what percentage of oxygen you would be delivering based on the amount of um, flow that you set on the cannula. And generally speaking, uh, if you have somebody on one liter, it's around 24%, two liters, 28%, three liters, 32%, four liters, 36%, five liters, 40%, and six liters, about 44%. Now, where this might come into play for the national boards is they might tell you that you have a patient who's on a 40% aerosol mask, and they they want the patient to be able to eat, and you would you put them on a comparable uh, nasal cannula flow. So you should know that uh, from 40% aerosol mask, you would put the cannula on about uh, 5 liters. The simple oxygen mask is the next uh, device that we have. It's typically set somewhere between 5 and 12 liters per minute. I will say this, it's rarely used clinically within the hospital environment. Um, occasionally you still see this uh, used um, with EMTs or on an ambulance. However, it's a low flow device and the delivery range is uh, pretty wide somewhere between 30 to 60 percent oxygen. So if you needed to give an accurate FO2, surely this wouldn't be the device that you would uh, choose. You need to make sure that you have at least five liters per minute uh, to prevent any carbon dioxide buildup in the mask. And anytime you put a mask on someone, keep in mind that although they may be breathing the uh, delivered FO2 that you have set, they're also going to be exhaling CO2 back. So you need to have a sufficient amount of flow incoming through the mask so that you can wash out the amount of carbon dioxide that they're exhaling. And so typically the civil oxygen mask would be used in short periods of time. You wouldn't want to uh, con continuously keep it on them. You could easily switch them over to a cannula, which would be a much better choice. And uh, the mask may or may not be humidified. It does have very limited use uh, in, in the hospital, but you will see it. And down here are a couple more examples of the simple oxygen mask. You can see that there's no valves. Uh, there are the uh, entrainment ports and the nozzle to connect your oxygen tube into. The next one then is the partial rebreather mask. Uh, this is also one that um, typically, uh, we don't use a lot, and it is a low flow device. You need to set the flow somewhere between 8 to 15 liters per minute to assure that the reservoir bag is at least half full during inspiration. And there is no one way valve between the mask itself and the bag. So the patient actually will exhale some of his carbon dioxide back into the bag. And since that's the case, Again, this one has very limited use. Um, the delivered FiO2 range is somewhere between 40 and 70% uh, oxygen. And the same uh, principle would apply that this bag should be uh, maintained at least one-third of the way uh, full because if the bag is collapsing, then you're obviously not providing enough oxygen flow uh, to the patient and he would start to... Uh, retain carbon dioxide, which could then impact his uh, respiratory drive. The non-rebreather mask, I would say, is a uh, fairly commonly used mask. It's somewhere between high and low flow. And the reason it is is because <clears throat> you will see here that there is an actual one-way valve here between the patient and the bag. And that's different than the, than the partial rebreather, because in the partial rebreather, I mentioned to you that there was no one-way valve, so the person would actually exhale back into the bag. Here we have oxygen filling the bag, and when the person goes to breathe, the valve opens, obviously, towards the person, and it will then give them that atmosphere or that FO2 of oxygen. When the person exhales, then this valve is closed, and the carbon dioxide then is sent out through the uh, air entrainment ports on the side. Now one thing to take notice of is that in this particular picture, 
there's actually three valves. There's the, the main one between the bag and the patient. And then there are two other valves on the air and trim reports. And again, these valves, these two, would open away from the patient, which would allow gas to escape, but would not allow any entrainment. <clears throat> on some of the uh, newer um, masks, they remove one of these valves, and they do so for safety reasons, because if something should happen to this main valve, then the person, since these other two valves actually um, only open to the out, the person couldn't breathe in. So typically you might see the non-breather these days with one of these valves missing. So you have the main valve and one other valve. And the impact that that has, obviously, is it will allow some entrainment. So if you only have one valve, your delivered FO2 will be somewhere between 60 to 80 percent. If you have both valves on there, then you can get close to 100 percent. Um, you need to set the flow rate rather high on the flow meter, somewhere between 10 to 15 uh, liters per minute or flush. That bag should be relatively full and it should not collapse on inspiration. That is something you want to remember for your boards because typically a scenario they might give you is that you know the bag is collapsing or you know half full or the person may be having difficulty you know what should you do. Well you need to increase the flow to the um, bag and the mask. Typically the non-rebreather um, will be used relatively short term um, and what I mean by that is there could be uh, in a trauma situation where you didn't really need the humidity but you wanted to provide a high level of FiO2 pretty rapidly. Sometimes um, when uh, someone's FiO2 has dropped considerably, uh, their <clears throat> PaO2, excuse me, or their saturation has dropped considerably and we need a very rapid uh, ability to deliver high FiO2, we can place them on a non-rebreather. The gas is drying, so it, over if we if the person needed the high FiO2 over a extended period of time, then we probably would choose uh, a different level of device that provided sufficient humidity uh, for the patient. That brings us to air entrainment mass, and uh, on the right here is a picture of a Venturi mask and. There are different types of adapters for the Venturi mask. So in this case, we can actually uh, pick one of the colored adapters. And on the outside rim of the colored adapters is written the FiO2 and the flow rate that that uh, adapter should be run at. And you can see that uh, the way you set this up is you have some reservoir tubing and the adapter, one end of the adapter goes into the reservoir tubing and the other end which in here uh, is a very small hole and the, the size of the hole is dependent upon which uh, adapter you use. Here for example this orange one is the 50% uh, adapter and it happens to have the largest hole uh, which is known as the jet. Uh, on this side these ports right here where you can see there's actually an opening on either side these are known as the air entrainment ports. So if you take a look at the mask for a second, <clears throat> the oxygen tubing is hooked up to a flow meter. And for example, let's say we're running six liters of flow through this tubing. Oops, excuse me. Okay, I, I hit that by accident. Uh, just returning to that, if we had six liters of flow running through the tubing, um, then what would occur is um, based on primarily Bernoulli's principle or uh, more modern theory is the viscous shearing forces of gas through that small jet. But what happens is as the oxygen travels through this tube and is, travels through a restricted orifice, air, room air is entrained. So we're mixing again 100% oxygen because that's coming from the flow meter, 100% oxygen with 21% air. The amount of air that is entrained is dependent upon the size of this jet. And the jet is the very small hole which you can't see. It's pictured on the other side of this. And the smaller the jet, uh, what happens is basically there's a greater drop in negative pressure. 
and more room air isn't trained in. So on a 24% Venny mask, which is the lowest FO2 that you could deliver, it has the highest total flow. And that's what I mentioned earlier, that high flow does not necessarily mean high FO2. As you move up from a uh, 24% up to a 50%, then you have a higher FO2, but your total flow goes down. Your total flow goes down because less room air is entrained through these entrainment ports. And it's very important that you don't block these entrainment ports. So you can see there's a, a plastic collar that typically comes with the Venny mask. And the significance of that clear plastic collar is uh, it prevents the sheets or anything else from obstructing the entrainment ports. And the question obviously is if I were to block the entrainment ports, if I were to take my fingers and cover these both sides of the entrainment ports, which are right here, what would happen to the delivered FO2? Well, if we cut down on the amount of room air coming in through the entrainment ports, then the FO2 to the patient would increase. Let me go through that one more time. If you block or obstruct the entrainment ports, which are right here, then less room air, 21% air, will not be uh, sucked in, and therefore your FIO2 will go up. So it's very important that these do not get blocked because the person's FIO2 will go up. The same principle applies if you have any kind of downstream resistance, downstream from the jet. The jet, again, is located right here. Can't see it. But any downstream resistance... If I were to kink this tubing right here, then flow would be coming through the jet, air would be uh, being sucked in through the entrainment ports, and would hit that resistance. What that would do would cause flow to back up. If flow backs up, then the room air will not be able to be sucked in through the entrainment ports, which would result in less room air mixing with oxygen, and therefore it would cause the delivered FO2 to the patient to increase. For an exam, it would be important to know the variable factors that impact the delivered FO2. And they are the jet size, the size of that little hole on these entrainment devices, the amount of flow that you set, and the size of the air entrainment port. Because we'll see when we look at the jet nebulizer that we utilize the same principle, but what we do differently is we have a... Um, fixed uh, jet size, which is in here, you'll see, and we actually change the size of our air enchantment port. So lower FO2s equal higher total flows and vice versa. So the lower the FO2, the higher the flow we're giving. As we go up on FO2 with the device, we don't deliver as high a flow because we're not training as much room air. Um, so we still commonly use the Venny masks. They're not humidified typically. Um, we have to be very careful about trying to humidify them, especially on a low FO2 setting like 24%, because there's be so much resistance for that little hole, the little jet, that will cause your bubble humidifier to pop off. And because there's a, a fair amount of entrainment uh, of room air, there's less drying, um, because room air still is, uh, carries relative humidity. If you had to select a device for a person with COPD and carbon dioxide retention, a um, high flow, low FiO2 uh, a selection of a Venny mask might be a good idea. 24% uh, Venny mask would provide a significant amount of airflow to them. So if they're air hungry, the sensation of uh, getting all that flow might help them, but they're still getting a low FiO2 or you might choose a uh, two liter nasal cannula. Now, I'm sorry. Now here is a uh, air entrainment mask uh, ratio chart. And the significance uh, of this chart is that you should I would I would suggest that you memorize this chart. There's obviously something called the magic box that you may or may not have learned. But this is a very rapid and easy chart to memorize, and it's a, it's a very quick guide 
in terms of your air entrainment ratios. And you can see that we have the FiO2 setting, we have uh, oxygen flow setting in, in this sample. I'm just putting in oxygen flow settings. We have the entrainment ratio, which is fairly fixed and does not change. And then we have the calculation of total flow. So one of the things you have to be able to do is to be able to calculate the total flow that a patient is uh, getting based on the FiO2 and the flow rate that they're set on. So if you memorize these um, entrainment ratios, which I would suggest that you do, then for the most part, there's really no need for the magic box. These are typically the standard FiO2s that we place patients on, and typically um, you don't get somebody on a 33% device, so for the boards you can pretty much uh, make it with uh, memorizing the air entrainment ratios. So let's take a look at it for a second. Um, if we have somebody on a 24% setting, whether it is a jet nebulizer or whether it is a venti mask, we basically have a 1 to uh, 25 ratio. And what does that mean? What does the 1 mean and what does the 25 mean? Well, the 1 means uh, oxygen and the 25 means air. So what it means is that for every one liter of oxygen, you will entrain 25 liters of air. So the quick and easy calculation obviously is to add these two together, and you have 1 and 25 is 26, and you multiply it basically roughly by the oxygen flow, and you'll get somewhere around 104 liters per minute. So the total flow is 104 liters, but part of that flow is four, four liters of that flow is oxygen, and 100 liters of that flow is air. And that's how air entrainment ratios work. So you're bleeding 100 liters of air with four liters of oxygen, and that's giving you a 24% uh, FiO2. Okay, so I didn't put my phone on vibrate, and you got to hear the NFL uh, theme the song because that's what's on my phone. But getting back to the air entrainment chart, um, when you think about total flows, you think about mixing, you think about mixing air with oxygen, and the ratios represent the entrainment. Well, I always believe in doing these things live, and so that was my phone ringing. But I, I apologize for that disturbance. Getting back to the air entrainment ratios chart of mixing air with oxygen, the ratio that you see here is dependent upon the FiO2 setting, which is dependent upon the whole uh, Bernoulli uh, Venturi principle. And one of the things that you can s clearly see is that as we go up on the FiO2, take a look at what happens to our total flow to the patient. So when we're delivering 70% uh, oxygen at 12 liters of oxygen flow, uh, the total flow is only 19 liters. And I mentioned earlier that a normal adult inspiratory flow rate is about 35 liters per minute. So we're not even meeting their inspiratory flow demands. So there's a good chance that if we're delivering a 70% uh, setting, with a jet nebulizer, there's a good chance that there'll be some entrainment and they may not get the 70% because they may be pulling in room air. So we'll see a device later on known as the gas injection nebulizer, which will allow us to deliver a very high flow at a very high FiO2. So that is a limitation. As you go up uh, on the FiO2, your total flow goes down. And at lower total flows, you get the highest FiO2. So again, very simple calculation. If you're faced with calculating total flow, uh, you have to know the entrainment ratio or utilize the magic box. And all you do is add those two together. And with a 31%, you have 1 in 7 is 8. 8 times 6 is 48. That's your total flow. And basically that's what I demonstrate on you know this next slide here. I give you a scenario where you have a 35% venti mask running at 8 liters. What is the total flow? Well, the ratio is 1 to 5. You got 6 times 8 equals 48. And then just to go over this one more time, in the case of a 1 to 5 ratio, the 1 represents the oxygen flow, and the 5 represents the air flow.
In other words, you have 1 times 8, which is equal to 8 liters of oxygen, and you have 5 times 8, which is equal to 40 liters, that should say of air, for a total flow of 48 liters. So let me see if I can grab the pen real quick uh, and get rid of that oxygen, because that should be air. That's a mistake. So we'll just do that. Okay, switching back to the pointer, let's talk about the jet nebulizer and I have a picture here, a sample picture of a jet nebulizer which incorporates a water bottle of sterile water and the actual uh, jet nebulizer component which you hook the large bore tubing to which you'll see in a minute and you have an ability to dial in the FiO2 and you have an adjustable air entrainment port and a fixed jet with inside the actual nebulizer. It pretty much works on Bernoulli's principle. Uh, you have a fairly wide range which makes it a very versatile device. We can set it from 28 percent to a hundred percent but remember that as you go up on the FiO2 what happens to your total flow? It goes down. Okay, so when we get close to the 100% setting, if we're running this on 12 liters per minute, our total flow is only 12 liters. So there's a good chance that um, they're, they're going to entrain and the FiO2 may not be accurate. Now, um, when you run these jet nebulizers, you should run them at at least 8 liters per minute. You need at least 8 liters to power the jet. If you run them uh, less than 8 liters, then they're not going to work appropriately. You're not going to get uh, proper mist. And you should see a mist. Uh, you should always check it whenever you set these up. Uh, before putting it on the person, you should make sure that you see a jet mist coming out of the nebulizer. You can use these with a variety of different types of masks, an uh, aerosol mask, a T-piece if you wanted to hook it to a trach, or an actual trach collar, or a face tent if they just needed some FiO2, some humidity, but not anything that's very accurate. One of the things to remember is that water will uh, collect in the tubing, and that collection of water in the tubing can cause back pressure on the, on the uh, jet and the, and the air and trim port. And anytime you have back pressure on an air and trim port, then less room air will be entrained, just like we talked about in the venting mask. And what will happen is the delivered FL2 will go up. That's another typical uh, concept or questions, question that, or could be questions, that they like to ask on the board. And that is, um, you know, do you know what impact uh, back pressure has on a, a venti device or uh, a jet nebulizer and the back pressure will cause the FiO2 to increase the patient. So if you have any water in the tubing or if the tubing should be slightly kinked, that could result in a higher than uh, delivered FiO2. A lot of people think that the FiO2 would fall because of the obstruction. Well, you'd have to completely obstruct it um, <clears throat> for the FiO2 to fall. And when you have back pressure and you have water in the tubing, you're also going, you may be delivering a higher FiO2, but there's a negative impact because you're cutting down on the total flow. So the person would probably end up in training room air, and so it's kind of a give and take situation. Now you can uh, heat these in case uh, you had someone with very thick retained secretions. There's actually a collar that can go on this metal part, and we'll jump over. And you'll see that here. Here's the heating device. So sometimes if you have somebody who uh, were bypassing the upper airway, let's say they have a trach and they have very thick retained secretions, we can apply a heater to try to help uh, increase the amount of uh, water, particulate water delivered to the airway and help maybe even thin the secretions. Um, here is, again, here's your, there's a baffle inside and you should all know that a baffle is something that reduces particle size. Uh, the way this device actually works is that uh, air comes through here, water is sucked up through the capillary tube, and then it is impacted with a baffle, and you get nebulization. You get uh, 
uh, water particles, particulate water that is then propelled by the gas uh, to the patient. You can see that there's an adjustable air entrainment port and that's based on the FiO2 setting. So as I dial it down and go to a lef lesser FiO2, the entrainment port will actually get larger. As I go uh, up on my FiO2, we can close it all the way off so there's no entrainment at all and that would be the 100% setting. So you have, you could hook this up with the large bore tubing and deliver it by aerosol mask. You could deliver it by trach collar. You could hook this up to a uh, trach by a T-piece. And one might ask, well, why would you do one or the other? Well, sometimes when we're uh, weaning a person, we haven't um, extubated them yet. Uh, T-piece is one of the modalities that we could choose where we could hook up the jet nebulizer and this would hook right to the end of the endotracheal tube. If they have a trach, permanent trach, and more than likely they'll, the trach collar is employed for uh, a longer duration of use. The face tent, here's an example of the face tent, and the face tent obviously is, um, in the case somebody may have facial in injuries or a broken jaw, post-op surgery, and they need some humidity, they may need some oxygen, but they don't need a, an, an accurate FO2, uh, the face tent could be uh, a method of choice. So we're on to the GIN, GIN, gas injection nebulizer. And I mentioned earlier that one of the limitations of a jet nebulizer, which we just went over, is that as the FO2 is increased, the total flow is decreased and that could result in entrainment. Now, prior to some of these newer uh, gas injection nebulizers, uh, we had, uh, and you still will see them, this is a flow meter that is in tandem, where we can uh, split the 50 PSI, and, and we actually, if you take notice to where these arrows are going, there's not only flow meters here that are, you know, where we can reduce the, um, 50 PSI down to whatever flow setting we want, but pay close attention. There are also uh, 50 PSI high pressure takeoffs here, and we typically could hook those to uh, hook a mechanical ventilator, high pressure hosing from a mechanical ventilator to one of those, um, or these gas injection nebulizers can be hooked right to these high pressure takeoffs in order to deliver up to 40 liters of flow at an FO2 close to 100%. Now, before we use the gen, if you can imagine for a second the jet nebulizer from the last slide, we used to have to take uh, two jet nebulizers, at least two, and hook one jet nebulizer up to this flow meter and one up to this flow meter and use a Y connector to connect the two large pieces of bore tubing. And we did that because if we were given 100% oxygen and we have it on the 12 liter setting, the total flow is 12 liters. There's no entrainment, correct? But if we put two flow meters together, then we could give, we could double the flow and we could provide around 24 liters of gas. So if we ran it on 15, maybe 30 liters of gas. So that would hopefully give us a more accurate uh, delivery of FiO2. Uh, now with the incorporation of the gen and the fact that we can run it off the high pressure takeoff, these devices can deliver 100% FiO2 at around 40 liters per minute. So they're very efficient um, and anytime we're dealing with uh, patients who need higher FiO2s and they're on an aerosol mask, jet nebulizer, and they're 50, 60, 70, 80 percent or above, we should truly consider the gin as an option and take them off the jet nebulizer and put them on one of these devices. Now you'll notice, you should notice there's something significantly different between the gin and the jet nebulizer. The gin has no adjustable FiO2 gauge. And if we go back for a second to the previous one, You'll see back here that we actually dial it in. We can fairly accurately dial it in. We should probably always analyze it to make sure these are not high-tech devices, but uh, historically they're fairly accurate. But we can dial it in on this one 
on the Jet Nebulizer. However, on the Gen, there's no dial-in. So if you were to hook the Gen to the 100% gas source, then you're getting 100% because there's no entrainment. So the question would then come in, well, what do I do if I want to give 85% on the Gen? Well, this is where we talk about bleeding in because you can see there's an accessory tubing here and it goes to this little green adapter which is known as a Christmas tree. That's just a universal adapter to hook to the end of the flow meter. But I can actually take this, uh, run the gin off oxygen and run this adapter off of air and I could start to bleed in some air. So I could create my own entrainment to try to bring the FO2 down. So you might ask, well, how do I know it's 85%? You have to analyze it. So you have to have an analyzer and you have to do what we call titrating. And as you increase the flow from an airflow meter, you will bleed more air in and therefore your delivered FL2 will go down. That works well if you're trying to do uh, high FIO2s. You run the main gas source is the oxygen and the accessory gas source is the air. But if you wanted to do, if you wanted to use the gin for some reason for a low FIO2, then you wouldn't run it off oxygen. You'd run it off air and you would bleed oxygen in. Because if you're trying to get this down from 100% down to let's say 30%, you're going to bleed a lot of air in to do that. So this can be run off oxygen or air, but typically you're going to see the gin is run off of oxygen. And typically we're using it for high FR2s. And we're doing that because it gives us a much higher flow. And if we can deliver 40 liters per minute, um, at 100%, there's a good chance we're going to meet their inspiratory flow demands and they're not going to entrain and their FIO2 is going to be accurate. One of the other things that you'll typically see in a gin setup or a jet nebulizer setup uh, is a water collection bag. And it's usually cut in line uh, between the larger bore tubing and sometimes it's actually tethered to the side of the bed and that allows the water to collect in the bag which prevents what? It prevents water building up in the tubing causing back pressure on the Venturi uh, jet and causing an inaccurate delivery of FIO2. Another thing is that um, you can actually get so much water built up in the tubing if you don't have a collection bag that water will actually spit out of the jet nebulizer and we'll go back for a second, and out of this port right here, you will actually get water spitting out onto the floor. And I've actually walked in rooms where there's so much water in a tubing because it hasn't been drained like it should, that the floor is soaking wet. And typically you can hear the difference, it's making a spitting noise, and water is actually being pushed out of the jet because of the back pressure. Okay, that um, pretty much gives you a fairly good overview of your different types of devices, both low flow devices and high flow devices. And I hope that you now have a clear understanding of a low flow device versus a high flow device, uh, when we might want to employ a high flow device as compared to employing a low flow device, uh, that you can now calculate total flow, that you understand the concepts related to total flow, that you're bleeding air and oxygen uh, into the patient, and um, that you understand how flow meters basically work and the different types of gas sources. So if you need to review this uh, a number of times, uh, I would recommend that you do that. But I believe that uh, being able to see it, uh, the visual of it, uh, is helpful. Okay, that ends this session on um, O2 and aerosol therapy one.